let's see here. Sister Rose sent this to me. And when she saw it, she said, uh, Brother Mike, this made me think of you. And it's a little poem called Pastor's Bible. My pastor's favorite book is the old King James. God's holy word sent to you and me. It comes so pure with its these and thous, a book that we should cherish, especially now. You know, thou and now rhyme. I thought I'd have to tell you that. Uh, man took the words and made changes to all, making it easier to stumble and fall. How can we gather in one accord when everyone reads from a different word? With strange words and verses left out, how can we teach without any doubt? Because out and doubt rhyme. Okay. All right, now we're on a roll here. When on its principles we take a stand, which one of these do we raise in our hand? The KJV that has always stood, just as the old saints said that it would. That's true. Should we raise the one that is new, or hold up high the one that is true? New and true, yeah. The choice that we have is obvious to me. I choose the pastor's Bible, the old KJV. And that, uh, there's a little thing at the bottom that says, uh, that was a poem uh, written in uh, 2018 um, by Sister Etta Stewart of Gethsemane Church. And it was uh, in uh, Pekin, Illinois, in memory of Pastor Frank Noyes. Now, I have a pastor that has been contacting me in Illinois. Um, his name is not Frank Noyes. What is it? I have to look it up. But um, he follows up. Nathan Noyes. It's spelled N-O-Y-S-E. Noyes, maybe, something like that. But anyway, um, I don't know. Maybe he's related to him. I'm not sure. I'll have to find that out. But I just thought that was good. And you guys now are cultured because you listen to poetry. That's all it takes to be cultured is to listen to poems. All right. Revelation chapter 10. No more poetry. Now we're into prophecy. Because this is a more sure word of prophecy. And I like that phrase in that poem. Should we uh, raise up the Bible that's new or raise up the Bible that's true? And I've done both, I can tell you that. And I'd rather have the one that's true. Amen. Um, let's read uh, from the beginning. By the way, let me ask one more time. Who's got it? Who thinks they know at least what the seven thunders would be about? What do you think they would, if you don't know exactly what they are, what do you think they would be in relation to? You know they got to mean something. Because God wouldn't just throw that in his Bible unless it had meaning to it. So anybody take a guess? Anybody have some thoughts, some theories? Some Seven judgments? You know what? What I think and what you think, there is a correlation. Anybody else? You want my glasses? Right, right. They, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, that is Revelation, the Revelation the fifth, 
Verse 12, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Okay? Um, what you are saying and what I believe, there is, a, there is a connection as well. Okay? Anybody else? I have a quarter I'll give to you. A quarter. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. good idea because that's what to me that's what thunder is it's a warning go hide in the closet okay get get or or in the car where you can't get electrocuted so anybody else all right then i'll take this home and it'll be seed money because i cashed in all my coins friday got 107 bucks out of it yeah all right, I'm not giving you that. Forget that. I will, I will give you a... I will, not, I will not give specifics because then it would sound like that I have some... I think I have some special knowledge that you don't, okay? And I don't. Um, but something that occurred to me uh, in that uh, I've already spoken of that uh, number one, it is it is God's voice. Okay, it is it is God speaking something. Okay, uh, brother George, you mentioned uh, God's judgment, God's wrath. Uh, Gary, you mentioned uh, the seven things that they said about Christ in Revelation five. That's a pretty good catch um, because it does deal with the number seven. There's a reason why there's seven thunders and not six, not eight, not twelve. Uh, or any other special numbers that are in the Bible. Um, and so just from uh, something that I n happen to know is mentioned seven times in the Bible, and it has something to do with something that God said, and he said it seven times. And I'll, I'll even go further. I think it's something that God said about Jesus. And he said it seven times. And John did not write it. John did not author it. He did, he did what he was told to do. He did not write what the seven thunders uttered. That's as far as I'll go with it. Because like I say, uh, I don't want anybody to think that I think I've got some special... God, God came and visited me in my office one day and handed me a letter with seven thunders on it. I don't, I don't, I don't know that. So anyway, that's, I've, and I've, I've known that or thought it for years, uh, and I just have never said anything to anybody. I thought, well, we'll just wait and see what God says. Amen? Because uh, gonna, it's going to be revealed at some point, and that's where we're going now uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 10. Look at verse 5. Uh, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. We talked about that. Uh, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be, here it is, time no longer. And again, uh, this doesn't mean that time's over with, God's going to finish time, and he's going to get rid of the, the heaven and the earth, and in doing so, he's going to get rid of linear time. We live in a, in a world of vanity in that we are bound by time going in a straight line and we can only go one way think of time as a river okay a very very fast moving river and it is it is impossible for us to go upstream going upstream is going back in the past because we've already passed what's what's upstream in other words we're going downstream and let's say that we passed a uh, a bear, you know, in the forest, and he was standing there eating fish out of the river we we're in, and we passed that bear, and the next day, we're a day away from him in time, and we would say, boy, I'd like to sure get a picture of that bear. Well, we can't go back in time and get a picture of that bear. Our opportunity, let's say it's a Sasquatch, let's say it's a Bigfoot, okay? And you say, man, we should have had our phones out, we should have been taking a picture of that. Well, you can't go back in time upstream to 
It violates the laws of physics. So we are bound by time going in one direction. We have to follow along with it. Now, I say that there is a passage in the book of Daniel concerning the Antichrist. And it says that uh, he shall seek to change times and laws. And it shall be given unto him. Now what would that mean, Kyle? That if, if he seeks to change time and God actually lets him do it, it was given unto him to do it, what could that mean? Well, if you were the devil, Kyle, okay, if you were the devil, yeah, don't nobody say nothing about him, just, okay. If you were the devil and you could go back in history and change one thing in human history, what would it be? Yeah, birth of Jesus Christ. And he tried it, didn't he? He tried it. You kill Jesus as a baby then he never dies on the cross, never offers himself as a sacrifice for our sins. It would, it would mean that everybody is doomed. Everybody goes to hell. Past, present, future, everybody goes to hell if you can go back and change that one thing. Now, I would have put it at the time of the cross. I would have, uh, we know, in fact, we know from the scriptures. I was reading this this morning early. Um, that if the principalities and powers had known what the mystery of God was, Christ dying on the cross and rising again the third day, he's the Messiah, he's our Savior, and so on, if they would have known it, they would have never crucified our Lord. The Bible says that specifically. Okay, So I, I would place it more along the lines of instead of Satan entering Judas to sell Jesus over to the Sanhedrin to be taken and crucified the next day, Judas does the exact opposite of whatever that would be. He would stand up and say, hey, I, I've been with Jesus a long time, and I know that he and I disagree on a lot of things, but that is the Messiah. I'm here, just here to tell you, you should really follow him. He would have done something like that to prevent Christ from being crucified. Not necessarily being killed. He could have been killed in other ways, but God's version of it was him hanging from a tree and taking all of our curses so anyway yeah they would have released jesus instead of barabbas here you go jesus you're free barabbas seems to be you bud huh exactly so but here we see time no longer so we know that at the end of everything, in Revelation chapter 20, um, John, or 21, John says, I see a new heaven and a new earth, and the old heaven and the old earth were passed away and there were no more sea. So we know that this heaven and this earth follows the laws of time. It goes in one direction. Um, so at the end of everything, God's going to eliminate time. When we are in heaven forever, we will not have any knowledge of the passage of time, which is quite a burden to us now because the Bible talks about us being patient. What is patient re related to? Time. We don't like hours and days and weeks and years being stretched out and, and us not receiving something that God promised. We want it now. But in heaven, that's all taken away. So, what I'm getting at is, it can't mean that God is eliminating time right here and right now. What he's saying is that the, the time that he has allotted for the age of the Gentiles to be saved and for the renewing of God's promise to Israel, time no longer, okay? Okay. It's, it's time now to initiate and to show what are the mysteries of God. Verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. We know it's not the seven seals, it must be the seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet, when he shall begin to sound, and according to verse 7, 
it looks like it takes days for its sounding. Or its sounding brings about situations that last days and not just a quick moment. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, in other words, at the very beginning of his sounding, something is going to take place. The mystery of God is going to be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, those prophets are all right here. Don't watch TBN. Don't watch, don't listen to some goofball on Facebook, YouTube. Don't listen, no goofballs on YouTube, Gary. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Don't listen to these people that say, I, I, know, I know when the mysteries are going to be. I know uh, when the rapture is going to be. I know this, I know that. God gave me a vision. God gave me a dream. And uh, I'm going to declare to you what those things are. Don't listen to those people. And I'm going to say this. I was really dismayed over this. I mentioned this before. The, um, when I heard that the, um, the my pillow guy... What's his name? Huh? Mike Liddell. When I heard he was a Christian, I'm going, yeah, all right. You know, no wonder the Lord's blessing him. But then I found out who he's hooked up with. He's hooked up with this new apostolic reformation. And I've watched these guys and they're, and they're uh, I don't know what, what you call it. It's not preaching. It's several of them up sitting on the stage and they're all sharing their personal prophecies that they say God told them and God showed them this. Now, here's what's funny. You can go back before 2020 and every one of those guys was prophesying that you know who was going to win the you know what. Because YouTube won't let me say it. And they, they, not, yeah, 2020, that he was going to win, landslide, God's told us that, and it's going to be over for the devil's kingdom. What happened? Irrelevant of how it happened, they said that he won. They lied. All you have to do is be wrong one time. But you know, those guys now have a bigger following now. It's like the fact that he didn't win. It was a big payoff for those guys who prophesied that he would because now they're saying, well, it was God's will that he win, but it didn't happen. The devil stole that thing. Yeah. And I'm going, no, it doesn't work that way. If God wants it to happen, it happens. But see, they don't believe that. They believe that God's got handcuffs on him sitting up in heaven. And until you release those cuffs from him in faith, God cannot do anything for your life. He cannot heal you. He cannot make you wealthy. He can't, cannot have you win certain things. All of those things God wants to happen, but the devil has it all bound up and you must release it in faith. That's not the God I serve. It's not the Jesus that I pray to. They have a different Jesus than the one that I believe in. The one that's in this book. Amen? It's a different Jesus. So anyway, moving around. The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So the prophets are here in the Bible. Don't listen to these fakes and phonies out there in the world. There is a false prophet going to rise up in the last days. Amen? So now, let's look at what that mystery is. I think we may have started this. But just very quickly, Matthew 13, 11, he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So Christ here, initiating this word mystery, telling us that it is for us to know what this mystery is, or what these mysteries are. I'll say it that way. And he says it again in Mark 4, 11, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Uh, and then Romans 11. Uh, if we turn there very quickly... We're going we're gonna to see that the mystery involves uh, two specific events. Romans eleven twenty five, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Here again, the word mystery is used, and the Bible's telling us, let me tell you what it is. Don't be ignorant of this. 
The only way that you can be ignorant of this mystery is that you don't read the Bible. You don't read it. You don't study it. You don't, you don't meditate on it. You don't think on it. And that's, that's how the devil keeps people in willful ignorance. There's two types of ignorance. You're ignorant of something that you haven't learned yet. Nobody's taught it to you. But you're willing to learn. The other types of ignorance is willful ignorance. You were told the truth. You chose not to believe it. You chose not to believe it. That is being willfully ignorant. Okay, and that's the worst kind of ignorance that there is. Amen. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part, so we cover up our right eye, that's where the New Testament is, they are partially blind, is happened to Israel, but they're not completely blind. They still read Moses. They read the prophets. Um, they read Isaiah, but they don't understand that Isaiah 53 was referring to Christ. And they won't, they won't believe it. And if anybody, and I've, I've seen this uh, from these guys that go to Jerusalem and try to witness to Jews. Go, they're going to the Wailing Wall. And he'll explain to them that everything that Isaiah 53 said concerning Christ on the cross happened to Christ while he was on the cross. He fulfilled everything in Isaiah 53. And upon that revelation, they will say, well, our rabbis taught us something different. You see, they have, they have placed their mind and their beliefs into the hand of those rabbis who are evil people because they keep their own people in bondage, keep them in slavery. And so they, they rely upon the rabbis to tell them what to believe. It's the same way with the Catholic Church. But anyway, uh, until, the, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So Israel is partially blind. But when the fullness of the Gentiles takes place, what does that mean? I think it means that when the last Gentile is saved, that's going to be saved, poof. They're gone, just like Elijah and Elisha. Just like Ruth and Naomi. The very second that Ruth gave birth to um, Obed, Naomi now has legal rights to the property and to the inheritance that her husband and her two sons left and they died without passing down um, to another generation. In other words, the two sons did not have sons themselves. They didn't have any offspring. So no, there was no one to claim the inheritance. And so it took a kinsman redeemer, Boaz, to marry the Gentile bride and when she gives birth, that child now is Naomi's child. Now, and that child is the uh, great, 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 great something grandfather of David. Okay? So that's how important that story is. But it involves the marriage of a Gentile bride and the birthing of a son. And then you'll find that, you'll find that in the scriptures. Um, verse 26, And so all Israel should be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. And right there he's mentioning uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. Romans chapter 16. Turn there. Verse 25. Now to him... That is of power to establish you. Notice it has the word stab in it. <laughs> God's going to stick it on us. Amen. Oh. I just had a bad, bad memory. Melissa, do you remember a real witch of a substitute teacher at Festus Elementary by the name of Mrs. French? I don't know what was wrong with this woman. 
But she was the most, maybe she just, I don't know, maybe she had a splinter in her backside and couldn't get it out. But she was the meanest human being I've ever known in my life. And when I got into second grade, my second grade teacher was pregnant and she was having her baby. And so for the first, I don't know, weeks, a couple months of being in the second grade, we didn't have the sweet teacher that I ended up with. We had Mrs. French. She was hateful. And she caught me one time looking over at somebody else's desk. And she yelled at me, get up here, just like that. And I'm scared to death. And she wrote out on a piece of paper like this, just drawing it like this, ripped it off there. How about if I pin this to your shirt? There it says copycat, just like that. And I'm like, I could not wait for her to leave. And when we got Miss Dougherty, the, the nice teacher, she was so sweet. Anyway, what was I saying that for? Um, yeah, stabbing, yeah. <laughs> now to him that has power to establish you, that what it means is fix you in God's salvation, fix you in his grace that you move not. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the, here it is, the revelation of the mystery. What is the revelation of the mystery? Which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So Jesus shows up uh, in the Bible first as Adam. Uh, he shows up as um, uh, oh, let's see here. The ark, Noah's ark. He shows up as the ark because in Christ is in the ark and you're safe. Uh, he shows up as Isaac, the only begotten son of Abraham who was offered up uh, for man's sins. And he just shows up in all these places. Moses, the lawgiver. Aaron, the high priest. Uh, the sacrificial lamb, the scapegoat. Uh, all of these things, the stone uh, that the builders rejected, the stone cut without hands, all of those instances where Christ shows up in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord in the burning bush, the angel of the Lord who showed uh, Manoah and his wife uh, that they were going to have a son and he was going to be a Nazarite from birth. So all of those, and then Samson now. First you have the angel of the Lord being Christ, now Samson is a picture of Christ. And the Bible says of Samson, he killed more of his enemies in his death than he did with his life. That's Christ. So Christ is showing up all throughout the Old Testament. But those who are living in that time and those who read it thereafter, they don't get it. It's because God has partially blinded them and they can't see. The veil is over Moses' face and they can't see who it is. But now it's made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets. It's made manifest according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations. In other words, this is not just for the Jews anymore, is it? This is for all the Gentiles, all the Jews, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Made known to all the nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. So here's what I think is going to happen. God is going to reveal the mystery to Israel. They'll no longer be blind. The fullness of the Gentiles will be uh, come in. And we are going to be taken off of this world at the last trump. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 2. Turn there. 1 Corinthians 2. Verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom... Among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. I don't want to hear, when I come and uh, listen to somebody's preaching, um, we're going to go down to uh, Brother Reg Kelly's camp meeting this coming weekend. I know Reg well enough to know that he wouldn't put up with it, but let's say I got down there and he brought a preacher in that he thought he could trust, and this guy, lo and behold, he's quoting Socrates and Plato and... Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, you know, Voltaire, Nietzsche. 
Yeah. Quoting all these people, you know, with, with witty sayings, and that proves God's real. Uh-uh. Paul said we speak wisdom, but not the wisdom of this world. Okay? Not philosophy. Not anything like that. Nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. In other words, this was all figured out before the earth was even created. Uh, for the head they, and this is what I was getting at uh, this morning, Kyle. Uh, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So if they would have known that in allowing Christ or putting Christ forward to be crucified, if they would have known that itself would have brought down their defeat, they would have never done it. If, if the Philistines would have known that by bringing Samson into the temple of Dagon and putting him over by those two pillars, if they would have known that Samson was going to bring those pillars down, and 3,000 people up on top of the roof come crashing down to their death, if the Philistines would have known that beforehand, they would never have brought Samson out there to be a display. They would have just let him rot and die in prison. But they didn't know it, did they? And God wasn't going to let them see it. That's how it is. We think that devils are this, you know, they have knowledge that goes way beyond, you know, our own understanding. Well, they might be because... Uh, Ezekiel says concerning Satan, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. But he's not all that smart. If he would have been, he would have never entered into Judas Iscariot. So the crucifixion would have never, ever taken place had they even got a, a, a glimpse of what was going to happen. Verse 9, but as it is written, Oh, I like this part. I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In other words, mankind himself, when he tries to visualize heaven, he's going to get it all wrong. Some are going to call it nirvana, which means nothing. Complete nothing. Some um, call it Valhalla. That's the Nordic, uh, the Nordic theologians and the Nordic uh, believers. But in Christianity, even though it is not entered into our heart, you look at verse 10, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Do we know what heaven is going to be like? Yes! Read the last three chapters of the book of Revelation if you want to know what heaven's like. There is a perfect description of heaven in the last two or three chapters of your Bible. God has revealed them to us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. In fact, this idea of us learning the mystery of God is evidence that God has revealed them to us through the Spirit. The Spirit searches all the deep things of God and it's all placed right in here and we have but to read it and to believe it, and maybe it doesn't quite click on day one, day five, day 105, but at some point it will. Either that, or you'll get to see it firsthand. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this book. Thank you for this old King James. Lord, it's true and, and it's right. And we thank you, God, that though the world may not understand what heaven's like and what is awaiting for us, Father, we know from the scriptures that place, that beautiful, beautiful place uh, where the river of life flows and there are 12 gates and 12 apostles' names written above them and 12 foundation stones and all of those beautiful things, streets paved with gold and the gates made of pearl. Lord, we know what heaven, at least on that part of it, Lord, we know what it's going to be like. And Father, we await the time when we will be in heaven with you for eternity. Bless your people today all over this world. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.